Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome to Final Fantasy XIV Versus. There's a lot of jobs in this game, each of them falling into one of five roles. In this series, we break down the jobs in each role, providing a brief description of how they work, along with their pros and cons. At the end, I'll crown one of these jobs the best job in the role. This episode, we're going to be focusing on the tanks, taking a bit of a break from the DPS, because the melee episode is going to be huge. Within the tank role, there are currently four jobs, and of course, they all share their own set of role actions. These won't be part of the discussion much because they're the same across all the jobs, but it's just worth bringing them up now. Some tanks also have some very similar skills. They all have a gap closer and a 40% defensive cooldown, but each of them has their own bonus effects as of Dawn Trail, marking some more distinct power differences between each of the jobs. Oh, and they of course have a you can't kill me button known as a tank invuln, each also with their different pros and cons. Excited to talk about it. First up, we have Paladin. This was one of the two tanks that were introduced even prior to A Realm Reborn and featured when the game was remade. This is your classic sword and board holy knight that's moved further and further into the spellblade side of things as the expansions have rolled through. The job focuses on maintaining a simple set of melee attacks before popping off with tons of instant cast magic and massive sword spells. This is backed by a solid array of defensive abilities, both for themselves and their allies. Paladin's gameplay loop is a pretty extended straight line. Their Royal Authority three-part combo gives them access to their Atonement combo, which can be stopped and started again so long as the Paladin has their Atonement stacks available. Each Royal Authority combo also grants a buff called Divine Might, which lets the Paladin cast their Holy Spirit or Holy Circle spells on their opponent with no cast time and with increased damage. Holy Spirit is a single target spell and Holy Circle is an AoE spell around the Paladin. Now once a minute, Paladins use Imperator to not only deal high off global damage to their enemies, but to activate the Requiescent buff. This causes their next four holy spells to be stronger and instant like Divine Might, but it also grants access to a new spell, Confidier. While you can technically use this on the other holy spells we mentioned earlier, using it on Confidier will open up a three-part blade spell combo. So in reality, you just mash the Confidier button four times in a row as it transforms between your different AoE blade spell skills. After completing the combo, you'll gain an extra off-global AoE called Blade of Honor for a bit more damage. Oh, and all of their spells and blade combos heal the paladin themselves, so the sustain during these times is really a nice bonus. If absolutely necessary, they can also cast Clemency, a standalone spell that the paladin can use on themselves or allies to heal for a pretty solid amount. You'll only want to use this in absolute emergencies or during solo content, but their survivability and support with this is fantastic. Not to mention if they heal an ally, the paladin themselves is also healed. On top of that, they just have a few off-globals to deal some bonus damage. A Circle of Scorn does an AoE dot on nearby enemies, and Expatian is just damage on and around the target. In addition to these, once per minute, the Paladin gets Fight or Flight as a personal buff. It not only increases their damage by 25% for 20 seconds, but they can also use Goring Blade as a follow-up powerful global skill to use in addition to their spell and blade combos once a minute. Now the big thing to judge tanks on are their defensive cooldowns, and Paladin has a nice array of skills unique to just them. First, the job can both block and parry, giving them multiple forms of regular mitigation. The block also works on magic while parry does not, so Paladin does have a distinct advantage in that category. You can never count on that kind of stuff, but it is worth mentioning. Paladins, however, can force themselves to block with their bulwark buff for 10 seconds, acting as a 20%-ish form of mitigation. For their other personals, first up is Guardian. This grants them 40% damage mitigation as well as a massive health shield, giving them a huge boost to their effective HP for that next big hit. They also have Holy Sheltron, which grants 15% damage mitigation for 8 seconds, a bonus 15% for the first 4 seconds, and even heals the Paladin over the next 12 seconds. This uses their Oath Gauge, which charges every time the Paladin auto-attacks an enemy. This gauge can also be used on Intervention to provide a slightly weaker effect on an ally instead. However, this effect is stronger if the Paladin has Rampart or Guardian up when they use it. It can also be used on Cover, which allows the Paladin to take damage for a chosen nearby ally for a short duration. It sounds great, but the skill just doesn't interact well with the damage that your allies take, so it only ever sees incredibly fringe use. 
For party utility, Paladin has a couple of pretty important skills. Divine Veil heals and provides a shield to all nearby allies, and Passage of Arms lets the Paladin reduce the damage of anyone standing behind them while the skill is channeling. You can hold it to maintain the buff, or quickly hit it once to just apply the buff for 5 seconds, which is the more common use. It also allows the Paladin to block if channeled, so it has quite a few applications. Finally, their tank invuln is Hallowed Ground. This makes them entirely invincible for 10 seconds once every 7 minutes. It's super strong but comes with a super long cooldown. It's important to note that this cannot be combined with cover, as that calculates the damage based on what your ally took, so you being invincible doesn't do anything. Oh, and I almost forgot to mention, they have Intervene, not to be confused with Intervention, which is their Gap Closer that does deal damage upon impact. They also have Shield Bash, which is a GCD stun exclusive to the job. While most mobs are immune to this, it's incredible for deep dungeon and exploration content, or wherever a raid fight can actually find any use, maybe like an ad phase or something like that. Otherwise, it doesn't deserve a spot on your hotbar, so use it very, very sparingly. So for pros, Paladin is a very well-rounded tank. Its rotation is simple to follow and actually has a ton of utility in downtime scenarios. All those spell and blade combo skills can be used from range, so if a mechanic lines up with their 1 minute buff window, they can more readily function from far away if mechanics demand it, and this is often reflected in the charts when looking at its damage compared to other tanks on certain fights. Their sustain and survivability is great, and their party support is a step above the other tanks, with two powerful party defensives. Even Shield Bash is a pro when it can be used, and otherwise it'll be off your hotbar and out of mind. Hallowed is the one tank involved without a negative effect as well, though we'll talk more about that in just a second. For cons, honestly, there really isn't that much. Right now, their DPS is fight dependent, but it's pretty much near the other tanks, sometimes a little bit higher, and DPS can be a big factor if it stands out when judging the tanks. Their hotbars are super bloated is another problem, and they have a number of incredibly niche skills. Their job gauge only increasing with auto attacks and being tied to defensive skills is also pretty annoying, especially when there's downtime phases. The other tanks don't have to deal with that and have far more reliable access to similar skills. Their gap closer, Intervene, which I only mentioned briefly at the end, also has damage tied to it, which some people consider a negative since they have to use it for optimal damage and then have to be kind of a little bit smarter about saving it for when they actually need it for its utility. Honestly, the worst thing is that Hallowed Ground's cooldown is 7 minutes, which often means it can't be used very much in a lot of fights versus the other tanks. Even with a few cons though, Paladin performs very well in both group and solo content, and so long as their DPS is good on any given patch, you're probably going to see them around quite a bit. Next up we have Warrior. Alongside Paladin, Warrior has been in the game for the long haul, bringing a Berserker's Touch to the tanking role. This job maintains a damage buff and then just swings their huge axe over and over and over for big damage, all while taking damage, healing damage, and protecting the team. Warrior's gameplay loop involves maintaining their Storm's Eye combo buff to increase their damage and using their Storm's Path combo to generate Beast Gauge and get a small heal. Every 50 gauge, the job can fell cleave or decimate their opponents for big damage. They can also use Infuriate to instantly generate 50 gauge and transform these skills into Inner Chaos and Chaotic Cyclone respectively, stronger versions of these skills that automatically critically direct hit. Infuriate's cooldown is also reduced by using any skill that would normally consume Beast Gauge, even if the skill is made free by another one. Which leads us to their most known ability, Inner Release. This grants the job a bunch of status effect immunity, but more importantly, it grants them three free uses of Fell Cleave or Decimate. Upon using all three, the job can also use Primal Wrath, a strong off-global AoE. Inner Release also grants access to Primal Rend, a massive AoE gap closer that critically direct hits. Oh, and those Fell Cleaves, they also all critically direct hit. Those Decimates, they will also all critically direct hit. Almost forgot to mention that. This skill also grants access to Primal Ruination, a massive AoE Axe Swing that, you guessed it, critically direct hits. They also have a gap closer that deals damage in that of Onslaught, which actually has three stacks, something unique to Warrior as well. They also have either Upheaval or Orogeny, off-global abilities that share a cooldown that will either deal single target or AoE damage. Now, despite all of that giving the job a Berserker persona, Warrior is actually incredibly defensive. Their 40% defensive ability is called Damnation, which just grants a regen when they take damage or the buff expires. That's nothing too major, but it does also deal damage back to enemies when they use physical attacks, so it can sometimes be a small boost in damage when used smartly. 
Thrill of Battle grants them a massive HP boost and a heal, while also increasing the amount of HP restored by healing actions. Super useful, especially when combined with other weaker mitigation tools. Speaking of healing, they also have Equilibrium, which just heals them a massive amount and grants a regen to boot. Oh, and really speaking of healing, their other most infamous skill is Blood Wedding. This grants them a tiny shield and some damage mitigation, more so for the first half, very similar to the Paladin skill. However, it causes the next six seconds of Warrior GCDs to heal them for every target hit. It's not based on damage either, it's just they get a heal for hitting targets, so they could sustain decently in single target situations, but they will literally full heal on large groups of enemies from a single attack, causing them to be capable of completely sustaining themselves in a lot of scary situations. Heck, some warriors just straight up big pull deep dungeon floors when soloing just to be secure, it's that strong. Warriors also have Nascent Flash, which is the same effect, it shares a cooldown, but it gives it to an ally instead. It also heals the ally every time the warrior performs a GCD. It's so incredibly powerful of a skill to grant to their co-tanks or any ally that's targeted by a specific skill to help protect them. Also, to protect allies is Shake It Off. This heals nearby allies, grants them a regen, and then a damage shield. The shield can be amplified by activating the skill with Thrill of Battle, Damnation, or Blood Wedding already active, consuming their effects and boosting the potency of the shield for each one consumed. Finally is their invuln type skill, Holmgang. This prevents the warrior from dying for 10 seconds, more specifically not letting them fall below 1 HP. They'll still take damage as normal, they just won't die. It only has a 4 minute cooldown in exchange for the fact that their health is still a concern while coming out of the skill. You get autoed as soon as it hits 0 seconds, that's not going to feel good if your healer left you at 1 HP. But it often really isn't a factor into how it's used. It also binds enemies in place if used on an opponent, though if you try to target an opponent with this and you're out of range, it won't activate at all, resulting in a potentially lethal scenario. It's very common to make a macro for this skill to prevent this from occurring, usually just making it so it can be used without actually targeting the opponent. For pros, Warrior has a lot going on. Huge burst damage, good self-sustain in all content, decent party utility, and to top it all off, it is really easy to play. A big positive is Holmgang's really short cooldown. It can be used many more times on average than the other tank invulns in the game, which alone makes Warrior a staple pick. For cons, the job's DPS is, at the moment, not all that poppin'. It's not bad, it's just lower on average than the other three tanks. There is also a weird con that's worth bringing up with inner release. I mentioned it gives a lot of crowd control immunity, and while this can be good, it can also be bad if fight timings line up, and somehow they always seem to do that. You might be immune to knockbacks during a mechanic where the intended strategy is to take a knockback, so making a macro that removes the immunity buff from inner release can help mitigate this or manually clicking it off. There is also the fact that Primal Rend is a gap closer. Again, sometimes this is great. Other times it means either delaying the skill, which isn't that much of a problem, or using it at your own peril. But a few conditional cons is nothing for most warriors, as it is one of the most popular tanks in the game, despite not being near the top of the tank DPS. Not to mention it's capable of solo surviving through a ton of stuff, even if a lot of it is easier content. It's just a very simple and fun job to play that is very effective at the role it has been placed in. Our next tank joined the roster in expansion later in Heaven's Ward with that of the Dark Knight. This job focuses more on rapid execution of DPS globals and off globals during its burst windows and has the ability to expend large amounts of MP to deal damage or protect itself or an ally. With Edge and Flood of Shadow, you use 3000 MP to deal damage to your opponents, either single target or AoE, while also activating Dark Side, a damage buff you'll want to maintain 100% of the time. For the shield, you can use the skill called the Blackest Knight at the same cost, 3000 MP, granting a 25% HP shield on whoever the target is. If the shield breaks, you get a free use of Edge or Flood of Shadow, so it's considered absolutely vital for resource management to ensure the Blackest Knight shield breaks, lest you lose a large portion of your MP value for damage. Fortunately, your basic combo does restore MP on the second GCD on top of a number of burst tools, but still be sure to utilize it properly. Dark Knights also generate 20 blood per finished combo, granting them access to Blood Spiller or Quietus for single target or AoE respectively. These attacks just hit harder than your average button, but both are essential to Dark Knight's buff window. Upon activating their Delirium buff once per minute, Blood Spiller is changed into a stronger three-part Delirium combo, Scarlet Delirium, Comeuppance, and Tor Cleaver. Quietus, on the other hand, is changed to Impalement for the next three uses instead. 
Any weapon skill used under Delirium also generates MP and blood, so it's a major point of power for Dark Knights. While popping off with Delirium, Dark Knight also has a slew of off-globals and other GCDs to manage. We already mentioned Edge or Flood of Darkness for their MP, which you will be using frequently during burst windows. Carbon Spit hits hard and restores some MP, or you can use Abyssal Drain for AoE, though it shares a cooldown with Carbon Spit. It's more used for the HP restoration on AoEs than its damage, but hey, it's stronger on three or more targets at the very least. They can also drop Salted Earth as a ground AoE to deal damage over time. This can then be erupted to cast Salt and Darkness for bonus damage once during its duration. Shadowbringer is a two-stack off-global line AoE during buffs, usually saving both stacks for every two-minute buff window. They also have Living Shadow, which summons a shadow named Esteem to deal a ton of damage to the Dark Knight's current target. This also grants access to Disesteem, another powerful line AoE, though this time a global cooldown you'll want to fit into buffs as well. Of course, Dark Knight is also a tank, despite all the damage abilities I just mentioned. Their 40% mitigation tool is Shadowed Vigil, which grants the Dark Knight a bonus buff called Vigilant. This heals the Dark Knight for a large amount upon falling below 50% HP or the buff expiring, giving them a bit more security on their health when dealing with big tank busters. They also have a couple of unique defensive cooldowns. The first is Oblation, which lets them place a 10% damage mitigation buff on any ally or themselves. It stacks up to two, so when combined with Blackest Knight, Dark Knight is capable of performing mass amounts of spot mit for allies simultaneously, especially valuable during progression rating. They also have Dark Mind, which reduces just the magic damage that Dark Knight takes by 20%. It goes without saying, but that means it only works on certain attacks, so be mindful when using it. Speaking of magic damage, their party mitigation is called Dark Missionary, which reduces the party's magic damage taken by 10%. Most raid wides are magic, thankfully, but again, it does feel bad if the boss has a physical type raid wide. Finally, Dark Knight's tank invuln skill is Living Dead. This places a buff on the Dark Knight that causes them to not die to lethal damage in the next 10 seconds. Should they take lethal damage in that time, Living Dead will change into Walking Dead, granting them protection against death for the next 10 seconds. However, if the Dark Knight doesn't restore an amount equal to 100% of their HP collectively over Walking Dead's duration, they'll die anyway. If they do, the buff changes to Undead Rebirth as a way of designating that they're safe. Fortunately, Dark Knights do heal a massive amount of health from all their GCDs during Walking Dead, so healers don't need to scramble that much to save them. Oh, and their gap closer is Shadow Stride, which just gap closes. No damage, two charges, generates bonus enmity. For pros, Dark Knight is a tank that tantalizes the busybody's brain. Having such a busy burst window makes you feel more like a DPS at times, a fairly different feeling from the other two tanks we've talked about thus far. They specialize against magic damage, and with so many spot mitigation tools, they can heavily assist with concentrated damage on multiple individual targets, both co-tank and party member. Their gap closer also deals no damage, meaning it can be saved for use on boss mechanics instead of being used for damage, a pro or a con depending on who you ask. For cons, though, Dark Knight has a bit of a troubled past and present. The job's identity has changed so much that I honestly have to consider it a con. You have no idea if the Dark Knight you have today is going to be the one you have in a patch or an expansion, and you have no idea if you're going to like the changes or not. It's a genuinely scary job to choose the main, basically. Their magic mitigation has the occasional weakness of having literally no value, and their spot mitigation, while nice, doesn't make up for weak moments with Dark Mind and Missionary. The busyness does of course come with some ping related issues and outside of buffs, they just have the same three button combo over and over again, which isn't too impressive. It's not like it's that much better than the other tanks, but I think it's at least a little bit worth mentioning. The job also has almost no self-sustain, especially when compared to Paladin and Warrior. Abyssal Drain has a 60 second cooldown, Shadowed Vigil 120 seconds, Living Dead's just your invuln, and Soul Eater is fairly small on your single target combo. Yeah, Blackest Knight will help shield you every 25 seconds, not sustain, but survivability, but it just struggles with a number of things. Despite that, you do see quite a bit of Dark Knights. Usually helps that their DPS is tearing it up on a lot of stuff, but that doesn't stop the job from coming under a lot of scrutiny. Finally, we come to Gunbreaker. This Final Fantasy VIII-inspired tank joined the ranks back in Shadowbringers, and it's been a fan favorite ever since. The job has a very DPS-oriented design, focusing on big burst window setups and rapid skill execution with the damage to match. For every combo it finishes, it generates a cartridge, which can be spent on a number of GCD skills. While it can be spent on Burst Strike or Faded Circle for a stronger single target or AoE GCD respectively, its most common use is on Gnashing Fang. This initiates a hard-hitting three-part combo, but you also get an extra off-global between each of these hits with your continuation skill. 
Continuation transforms into the bonus off globals all on one button, and even grants follow-ups to the aforementioned Burst Strike and Faded Circle. Altogether, this gives the job its rapid attack feel that gets you forgetting your tank sometimes. They can also spend two cartridges at once on Double Down, not the KFC sandwich. No, it's a massive potency AoE GCD every minute that you'll desperately be praying will crit and direct hit. You can also generate three cartridges every two minutes with Bloodfest, a major part of their burst window, and people think Pot of Greed is OP. This even grants access to their level 100 skill, Reign of Beasts. This is a massively powerful three-part combo that ends with the franchise staple of Lionheart. On top of using all of their cartridges, they also have a few other DPS actions. No Mercy is a buff gunbreakers use every 60 seconds to boost their DPS by 20% for 20 seconds. This grants access to Sonic Break as well, a GCD which deals some damage and places a 30 second dot on the opponent. They also have Blasting Zone as an off global single target ability and Bow Shock, an AoE off global attack that also inflicts a dot. They used to also have their gap closer for damage, but the damage was removed this expansion, so those are only for actual movement now. Now, they are actually a tank, despite all I've described, and they've got some pretty strong tools. Their 40% mitigation tool is Great Nebula, which additionally grants the Gunbreaker an extra 20% max health and heals them for that amount upon activation. This is, in my opinion, the strongest of the 40% mitt from all the tanks. It just has so much value. They also have Camouflage, reducing their damage taken by a measly 10% for 20 seconds, while also increasing their parry rate by 50%. While this can lead to a 10 and 20-ish percent mitigation if the parry procs, this will often be paired with other things instead of being solely relied on. Heart of Corundum is their short duration, short cooldown defensive. This reduces damage taken by 15% on the target for 8 seconds, an extra 15% for the first 4 seconds, and will trigger a heal if the recipient falls under 50% HP or the effect wears off. This effect gives incredible safety to the user as long as they survive, and helps propel Gunbreaker's survivability a decent bit. Speaking of healing, Gunbreaker also has Aurora, a regen that they can cast on themselves or an ally once a minute that holds up to two charges. It's good healing assistance and sustain, but it's nothing crazy. Heart of Light is their party mitigation, reducing the party's magic damage taken by 10% for 15 seconds. This suffers from being magic only, so be wary about what damage type the boss's AoEs actually are. Finally, their tank invuln is Super Bowl Eyed. This ability has a 6 minute cooldown and reduces the Gunbreaker's health to 1 upon activation. Once you've personed yourself, you'll take no damage for the next 10 seconds. It's a decent tank invuln, but being a 6 minute cooldown does limit its usability in raids when it comes to skipping mechanics or tank busters. Not that big of a deal, but worth mentioning. So for pros, Gunbreaker is meant for DPS players looking to play tank. It's fast, it's fun, and it hits quite hard. The resource management is a bit more meaningful than all the other tanks, albeit just barely. Their personal defensives are also excellent, and I can't stress how much I love Great Nebula, and my appreciation for Heart of Corundum has also improved immensely. It's easy to fall in love with a job that feels good and does well, and that's definitely Gunbreaker. And of course, they do have the gap closure that deals no damage, so they can focus on having it for utility instead of having to weave it in for damage. However, with the cons, Gunbreaker has some clear shortcomings. Its busyness can be just as much off-putting, and any fight where you have to fight for uptime can throw off your cartridge equivalent of a circadian rhythm. Not to mention that with all those off-globals, ping is definitely an issue. Heart of Light being magic only means the job's party mitigation can be nearly non-existent, minus the spot mitt from Heart of Corundum or the tiny Aurora heal. Its sustain is not the greatest, but hey, it's not Dark Knight, so that's a win. Overall, while the job can have its problems, it's been an insanely strong and frequent pick ever since it was released back in Shadowbringers, and it doesn't show any sign of slowing down now. All right, that's all four tanks, so it's time to rank them. First off, on the bottom, Dark Knight. I hate to bully the job while it's down, but it feels like almost no one is pleased with this job. Tanks often avoid playing it, healers don't want to do dungeons with it, and even fizz range like myself feel bad for them. Between limited usability on its magic-based cooldowns, lack of self-sustain, and unsatisfying job identity, obviously just an opinion, but a lot of people have it, often the only thing saving it is that it does good damage, though tank damage is similar enough across the board that I wouldn't really be flaunting that. Now, the other three tanks are a lot closer, in my opinion. For number three, I think I'm going to go with 
Gunbreaker for a mix of reasons. I mean, Heart of Light being magic only is definitely part of it, as well as its reliance on tight melee uptime to be played comfortably. With so many off globals, it can also be a little bit chaotic if you have high ping, so that might cause problems as well. But the job performs perfectly fine, and the majority of AoEs are magic, so Heart of Light is often not a problem. Sometimes, but not often. But I have a feeling our number two and number one will establish themselves quite well. So Paladin and Warrior are super close for me, but I'm gonna stick Paladin at number two. Originally, when I wrote the script, I put Gunbreaker at number two, but after thinking about it further, I think Paladin deserves this spot for a number of reasons. Having two reliable party support tools is invaluable in a lot of scenarios. It also has strong downtime tools in the form of both support with clemency and damage in the form of their one minute buff. As long as they can actually get their Confidior combo going, they have a pretty extended time of being able to make use of smaller boss hitboxes. And if Dawn Trail creates more downtime scenarios, with or without a targetable boss, I think Paladin will just shine more and more as the expansion goes on. So this is kind of like a tentative number two. If if they kind of go back into more Endwalker-ish design, whether because of feedback or just, you know, they don't commit all the way, then Gunbreaker kind of jumps up to number two more for me. But for now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put Paladin there. Really value having both Divine Veil and Passage of Arms on top of everything else. And Warriors number one, of course it is. I mean, people have always been saying, oh, Warriors OP because of the sustain, but it, that's a factor, but it's not really the reason why it's number one. The job's frequent tank involved with Holmgang is a huge reason. You just get to skip so many tank busters or mechanics that tanks are supposed to deal with. And it's definitely one of the most abused tank skills across the entire spectrum. Of course, it actually has Shake It Off affecting anything. You know, it doesn't have the Heart of Light problem, but it's not as good as Paladin's double skill because they have a shield and they have a party mitt. But also, Warrior is just so easy to play. Yes, the sustain is a crazy good thing. It just does a lot of things really well. There's a reason why even when its damage is a little bit lower than the other tanks, like it is on average right now, that you still see everyone play it because there's always at least one person who wants to just go unga bunga, swing my axe, get the dopamine hit, and be able to invuln pretty much all the busters that they can, every other buster practically. So yeah, Warrior is going at number one, but... Uh, it could be dethroned. I, I, I don't think that's a, a firm number one. It's just gonna be number one in this video. And that's gonna be a wrap for our tank versus for Dawn Trail. Definitely expecting to revisit this later in the expansion, whether job changes happen or not. Again, the Paladin thing is just, I wanna keep my eye on that. But thanks for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe and stay tuned. We still got two more verses to get out before patch 7.1, and then we can continue to rejudge the jobs from there. Anyway, thanks for watching and I'll see all of you in the next video. Until then, take care.